segue than having him say, well, you know, Richmond is that place that wants to change but stay exactly the same. Because I came to Richmond five years ago um, to the Civil War Center, and let me tell you, nothing is more challenging than dealing with the American Civil War in the heart of the Confederacy <laughs> as a black woman. <laughs> so here's the thing, sacred cows. It's interesting to me that this term, sacred cows, actually shows up in 1850s. It's, it's, it's actually done by an immigrant from India. He is Hindu, and he is checking on the Hindu community in the Midwest. And he writes a letter to the Maharaji back in India about his experience. And he says, well, the community is doing really well. Um, there is a problem. They seem to be putting at the altar the uh, wheat and the barley but then they change it to beer and then they drink it. And some of them are actually eating the cow. We have to fix this. Now, by 1905, this term has been picked up and is running like wildfire. The sacred cow, those things you do not touch, you do not criticize, you do not dare try to interpret. Just so happens, though, that I came along into museums at a time where little brass people like me were asking all kinds of questions about the past in different ways. And my first job was actually working at the venerated Colonial Williamsburg. You know, this place where you used to make candles and make soap and people would be so happy and they'd dress up in these wonderful costumes and they'd talk about the founding fathers as if they were the Christ themselves and they, it was just Millions of people flocking to the little town of Williamsburg, Virginia. There was not a tree, not a flower, not a person out of place. And some of us kept saying, wait a minute. This was a city. It had a lot of people. Not quite as many who worked there as they actually lived there, but 52% but of those people were black and enslaved. And there were dogs and horses and pigs running in the streets every day. So that meant there was a lot of sh um, <laughs> stuff in the streets. So we decided, you know what, it might be interesting if we started exploding some of these myths and really deal with what it was like to live in this 18th century city that was the, in the wealthiest colony of all the 13. What was that like? So we started mixing the pot, we started doing programs, and we started doing all kinds of things. And we actually started having some of those people dress in costume actually portray people of the past. Because even though people were in costume in Williamsburg, they didn't really do that. They just, it was just, you know, wasn't it nice to see your clothes? <laughs> so we started portraying these people, and some of them weren't very nice. And all of those fun pictures that people used to take of putting their heads inside the stocks, you remember those? Guess what? We had a character who played the sheriff who went up and said, okay, your head's in the stocks. Um, what have you been convicted of? Because it's time to nail your ears to that. And then the community's going to come by and throw food at you. And then and people were like, what do, you, what do you mean? Put nails in my ears. He said, yeah, that's what these are for. And then, well, our vice presidents decided, well, what would happen if we left stuff in the street? And so we did that. <laughs> There was no longer the happy little man coming behind with the pooper scooper. And visitors lost their minds. What are you doing to Williamsburg? You're talking about black people and slavery and you got stuff in the streets. Oh my God, it is the apocalypse. <laughs> but see, here's the thing. I can't believe it's been 20 years ago. I was really young. Uh, we decided to show an estate sale at Williamsburg, okay? We decided to use this grand weekend that Williamsburg had been doing literally for 30 years where they were talking about how all the delegates came to Williamsburg to the Raleigh Tavern and the Weatherburns Tavern and they started having the conversations about what it was going to be like when they headed to Philadelphia to the Constitutional, I mean to the uh, convention to deal with 
this whole question of trying to become independent. And what was remarkable about these times was that during that time, people conducted their end of year business. This occurred every October. And part of that end of year business is settling your debt. And part of settling your debt was selling things that you didn't need or just needed cash for. And that often meant slaves. So while these men were discussing liberty and independence and a new nation and all of that literally on the steps outside, human beings were being bought and sold. We did that. And people lost their minds. And then they woke up. And all of a sudden, all of these great houses, these great places, Mount Vernon, Monticello, Montpelier, started having honest conversations at their sites about what it meant. Thomas Jefferson didn't go out there every day and mow his own grass and tend to his own gardens, for God's sake. And they started talking about it. You see, the thing about a sacred cow is that they can provide you with tremendous nourishment if you're just willing to milk every now and then. Same thing happened here in Richmond. A little under eight years ago, a group of pretty smart men said, you know what, we gotta change the conversation about this Civil War. You know, we gotta have a different conversation because it's been lopsided for too long. So they opened this little museum called the American Civil War Center at Historic Treader. It was going to tell the story of the war from three perspectives, Union, Confederate, and African American. They were going to talk about three big themes. What did home mean? What did union mean? And what did freedom mean? And they were going to put it all in one, under one roof. Believe it or not, eight years ago, this was the first museum in the country to do that. So I had to come. <laughs> And what was remarkable was that there was a series of waves happening at the same time. It was interesting that here in Richmond, the Virginia Historical Society was getting a new leader. Valentine was going through some significant changes. And a number of cultural institutions were coming together to have a different conversation about all of Richmond's history. Because it ain't pretty. But guess what? When you've got all these sacred cows running around and you don't take the time to really explore, you run into problems, you run into dysfunction, you run into the lie. When I first, I was here for a week, I spoke with one of our major donors and I said, well, what would you like me to know about this, this community? I mean, I grew up in Williamsburg, you know, it's not that odd. And he said, well, you gotta remember two things. Richmond was formed on two lies. One, the first lie was, Slavery was good for black people. The second big lie was that tobacco won't kill you. <laughs> but it was extraordinary because it was the last thing I expected to hear from this much older, very wealthy white man. He said, if you can get people to really look at what Richmond was, through this one thing that they value so much, we can have a different conversation in our city. So over the last five years, we've been doing a lot of different conversations. We've been talking about some of the things that have plagued us, that somehow the North was this gracious, you know, uh, free the slaves, go into war folks, and they weren't. No, 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 no. They went to war to save the Union. Lincoln threw in that slavery thing halfway through. The goal was to keep the Union together. The reality of slaves living in the North at the time of the American Civil War is mind-blowing to people. Somehow, if you managed to cross the Mason-Dixie line North, you were free, hallelujah, and life was good. Wrong. Just read the story of Solomon Northrop. Twelve years a slave. Pennsylvania captured, thrown back into slavery in the Deep South. Had never been a slave, actually, in his whole life. Or when we talk about our glorious city being, in fact, the second greatest port for the interstate slave trade, right down there, Shaco Bottom, 
Shaco Bottom. 40 different auction houses. Shaco Bottom. Places where you drink your beer, places where you store your stuff, the converted lofts where you live. Auction houses and jails for holding people who are going to be sold down the river. Because guess what? There wasn't a lot of cotton being grown in Virginia. Most of the enslaved people here, yes, they worked plantations. Yes, they worked in households. Yes, they lived in cities and skilled labor. And some of them actually had freedom of movement. But Virginia was also the place where slaves were bred for sale down the river. Because you see, at this time, by the 1850s, 1860s, you weren't, we weren't importing Africans anymore. Myth, one, myth number two blown up for you. But let's talk about the South too, shall we? Know a little thing about our city. Did you also know, with all these auctioneers and folks coming in and armies moving through and what have you, Richmond was also one of the top five places for whorehouses in the country. Did you know that? We had a lot of soldiers here who got nasty, nasty diseases. And we had about 70 hospitals to treat the war injured and to treat people who had these problems. I mean, look, the bottom line is if we can't have a conversation about the horrors of war, all of it, if we can't have a conversation that respects and understands that people go to war for different reasons. If you ask someone today that's in the military why they're in Iraq or why they're in Afghanistan or why they're in any number of other places, their reasons are different. Ultimately, on some level, it's about service. But for those guys back then, it was about getting drafted, conscription, but see, all of that doesn't play well when the war ends because there's so much loss. And part of the story that we've been missing all of these years and talking about what happened on the battlefields and all of that is we've forgotten the stories of the women. We've forgotten the stories of African Americans and self-agency. They, they weren't sitting on a rock waiting for Europeans to come and get them and take them to America to give them Christianity and make them whole people. And they certainly weren't sitting by waiting for freedom to come. They seized it. But there were others who chose to stay and wait it out, see what's going to happen. Women, women, Richmond women, Memphis women, Atlanta women, women throughout the South did a remarkable thing. Unlike the federal government where they had the ability to go and retrieve their dead and bury them in national cemeteries, the federal government already had a system set up. The Confederate government did not. Even though this Confederate government was larger than the United States government would be until the New Deal. Larger than the federal government would be until the New Deal. The Confederacy was huge, its government, for a lot fewer people. And the question is why? But I'm not going to tell you that today. <laughs> you have to come to the museum and find out. <laughs> My point is, history is a remarkable thing. And I'm going to borrow a contemporary phrase that I think is absolutely wonderful. It, said, it says, some men aren't made to be happy, they're meant to be great. When we look at our great men, there is a lot, a lot, the so-called great men, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of contradiction there. There's a lot of inconsistency there. And the beauty of that is that if we are really willing to look at our past, warts and all, we can glean for ourselves the possibility of greatness in ourselves, both as individuals as communities and as cities. And I am here to tell you that this city is getting healthier every day. When this city decided to stop 
lying and hiding about its slavery past and its connection to this war, its central role in this war, people started talking about what to do differently in Shakoba. People started thinking differently about what needs to be preserved. All of these battlefields, all of these things that millions of dollars have been saved to save them, there's one great battlefield that has the airport on it. The Battle of Newmarket Heights. And you know why? Because after three attempts by Union forces to take that place, it was finally taken by the United States Colored Troops. And because of their action on the field that day, 14 of the 16 men who would earn the Congressional Medal of Honor, 14 of the 16 black men who got it during the Civil War was because of that battle at Newmarket Heights. And most of it has an airport on it. But the good news is, it's going to open to the public in the next couple of years. Through partnerships, through alliances, been able to get as much of that land as possible. Because people are paying attention. This war was unfinished business from the revolutionary era. This war was about who we were going to be moving forward as a nation whether we really were going to be a republic founded on the notion that all men, all human beings were created equal. So you see that Bill of Rights that was put into place to protect individuals from abuses of government, the constitutional amendments that follow expand, in fact, who would become an American and to protect those Americans against the abuses of the states. So, here endeth the lesson. Every now and then, don't be afraid to milk your cow. <laughs> Every now and then, if you are starving, if you are lost, if you can't figure it out, there is a pattern. There is a past that helps you find the new solutions. And this community, I would argue, is on the verge of something extraordinary. Extraordinary. And I am just so glad to be here while the boat has been rocked and lifted and the cow has been taken off the pedestal and allowed to graze a little bit. I'm just happy. And with that, Move. <laughs>